goes beyond she's brave. why married people live longer than unmarried people. When they feel grumpy, they have a good moan. But they don't tell us how long the listener lives. But anyway, here goes. The thing nowadays that really makes me grumpy is bankers. This gentleman is Sir Fred Goodwin, and he was the head of the Royal Bank of Scotland when it went bankrupt. And like other greedy bankers, he helped to create the current economic crisis, which cost many people their jobs, their homes, and their income. But his bank was saved from bankruptcy by millions of taxpayers' pounds. His greed and failure, however, were not punished. Instead, he was rewarded with early retirement at the ripe old age of 50, with a pension of 700,000 pounds a year for the rest of his life. This makes me grumpy. Now, this banker gets 10 million pounds from Barclays Bank every year. In 2010, he was awarded a £7 million bonus. And Prime Minister David Cameron tells us that we are all in this crisis together. This makes me grumpy. And to change the subject, it makes me grumpy when instead of slamming the door in people's faces, I politely hold the door open for them and they don't even turn around to look at me, let alone say thank you. Even when I call after them, thank you, thank you, I'm not a doorman. Do I look like a doorman? I'm a free man. I'm not a doorman. And I'm also grumpified by people who smoke where it is forbidden to smoke because they think it is their right to do so, regardless of the rights of others not to smoke. And it makes me very grumpy when libertarians call for solidarity with smokers, oppressed by the state, down with the state, up with smokers. It makes me grumpy to be waiting for ages for a bus. And when it finally turns up so full that people are cl packed close together like sardines in a boiling tin and all the windows are shut and I'm standing so close to a complete stranger that we are almost making love. <laughs> and I get even grumpier when someone tries to open the window because we're all suffocating and sweating like pigs. And some little old lady complains that she's going to catch pneumonia. And then I have to pay for the privilege instead of being compensated for being treated like a bleeding sardine. And anyway, as you've noticed, I get grumpy when I see a driver go straight through the red traffic lights as pedestrians are crossing the road. And the driver is holding a mobile phone in one hand and driving with only one hand on the wheel. That is, if he's not using the second hand for his cigarette or his coffee. I also get grumpy when at the railway station, 
taxi drivers fish for customers who are going the longest dis distance, and they ignore the queue of people waiting patiently. And I become grumpier when I ask them to take me to the old town where I live, and they look at me as if I'd said, take this taxi to Cuba or Venezuela. <laughs> and I get grumpy when drivers park their stupid car on the pavement and force me and parents with children in pushchairs and people with disabilities to walk in the road, taking their life in their hands so that these donkeys Donkeys can park their tin can on wheels where it suits them. I love moaning. Oh, I just love being grumpy. Now, what really gets on my proverbial tits is being woken up during the, my siesta by a telephone call from a complete stranger with a voice like a robot who wants to sell me yet another credit card or some other rubbish I'm not interested in. And I would never buy by phone anyway, even if I was interested. This really makes me grumpy. But there is only one thing that makes me grumpier <laughs> than watching distinguished celebrities like Queen Elizabeth, Gordon Brown, Barack Obama, Hillary Clinton, picking their noses in public. And that is, and that is, that is, that is sitting, sitting in the middle seat of three in economy class on a plane. And the worst case scenario, you know what it is? It happens when a very large man, sweating profusely, squeezes in next to me. And I'm trapped for three hours while he picks his nose non-stop as if he were excavating a bottomless gold mine. People in post office, People at bus stops, people in doctors' waiting rooms and hospitals, people in banks, people at passport control and checking counters, people who think they're not born to wait, people who are busier than everybody else, people who jump queues in all of these places, they make me grumpy. And now, something that really makes me grumpy, people who hunt animals for fun, they make me grumpy, people who kill birds and ducks as a sport, that makes me very grumpy. And people who hunt bears and species in danger of extinction make me very grumpy indeed. People who say they kill animals because they care for the environment make me incredibly grumpy. Now, for something a little bit milder, people in the cinema who eat popcorn noisily and slurp Coca-Cola loudly, or people who talk on their mobile phone at a very quiet moment in the film makes me want to grab their bag of crisps, stuff the mobile inside, pour the Coca-Cola into the bag, and stuff it into their pocket. <laughs> and talking of noise, why do restaurants and cafeterias insist on playing junk music as soon as they see me coming in? Do they think I like noise pollution? Can't we have a meal or drink our coffee in peace and quiet? Peace and quiet, peace and quiet, peace and quiet. Have you noticed the way in fast food places like McDonald's, they take your order, then they ask you if you want a Coke or an apple pie or something you have not asked for? And they also tell you to have a nice day, as if you're old friends, as if they care. This makes me really grumpy. And in the end, as T.S. Eliot said, is my beginning. Over three billion people live on less than two dollars a day. In 2010, British banks divided a total of seven billion pounds in bonuses to their top bankers. This makes me very, 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 very grumpy. Thank you. He's not real. He is. He is. We're coming to the end of the Pachatka evening. We have one more presentation, a very special presentation by someone who is very familiar to all of you. Actually, we'll just get right to it, shall we? Anna Parisi. Hello, and uh, well, good to see you again. Well, my name is Anna Parisi, and I run a language school in Thessaloniki, here in Greece. Uh, and our country has just escaped uh, bankruptcy, or so they tell us. But it is in times like this that we have to actually um, explore new directions and make radical changes. And now that Mary is too tight to mention, uh, in our schools we have had to actually look for um, you know, new ideas. And uh, this is what I'm going to share with you this evening. Uh, I'm going to share with you what we have found out 
and uh, you know this direction that will actually bring to us all not only a lot of job satisfaction but also buckets of money to the industry. But first, let's have a look at the target groups that this industry is actually uh, has been focusing on for far too long, I think, and the problems of these groups. This is the first group, the young learners. Uh, actually, they don't learn that fast. They don't actually know what it is that they're learning, and uh, they have a very, very big disadvantage, uh, which actually is making everybody's life very, very dif difficult. Yes. Their parents. <laughs> now, parents, unfortunately, is uh, a disadvantage that is shared by the next group of uh, learners. Uh, maybe the most difficult learners, uh, because you know, lots of problems there. Um, they smell, uh, <laughs> and while you're trying really, really hard to teach them the present perfect. They have something else in their mind, actually they have something else in their mind all the time, which, to put it mildly, is, uh, I don't know if you can guess, but this is what it is. Well, that is putting it mildly. Now, of course, they know that Lady Ganga did not learn the tricks of her trade at school, um, and uh, neither has anybody even, you know, slightly successful. So, they have actually given up on that, on us. They're not interested, they don't want to know what we have to say, and the ones who are interested, uh, really, they are wasting their time, and we all know that. Now, let's go to the next group, uh, which is possibly the most unreliable group of all, uh, because, you know, they're terrible. First of all, they lose their jobs. Then, they have no money. They have lots of problems because they are the parents of the previous two groups. <laughs> so, you know, what do we do? Where do we go from here? Well, ladies and gentlemen, I am about to reveal to you the one and only group that has only disadvantages and will bring, um, you know, a very, very positive washback effect on our teaching, will restore our, um, you know, cuteness in society, and will actually bring uh, buckets of money to the industry. And uh, I don't know if you're guessing, uh, this wonderful group are our third age learners. First of all, they have no parents. <laughs> they know a lot of the famous people in the course books. They're old enough to know these old people. Thank <laughs> you. 